We're live, Your Worship. Council, I'd like to call this committee the whole meeting for April 11th, 2024 to order with adoption of the agenda to be amended with item 7A, the zoning bylaw update moves to follow items 10A and 12A. Someone want to make that motion for me? Council Cherry, Council Lucio, all in favor? Motions carried. And adoption of the minutes of the uh, Committee of the Whole from March 14th. Someone want to make that motion for me? Councillor Devlin. Seconded by Councillor Lucille. All in favor? Motions carried. Any business arising from those minutes? Councillor Palmer. Yeah, I'm just wondering if there's any update on the uh, uh, DCCs and what when the next time we'll be, be hearing something at the council table. Mr. Parliament, any comment? I, Mr. Black, you're here. I'm sorry, I didn't see you. That's a sitting right up front. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, members of council. Um, about two weeks ago, top of my head, um, met with me, my consultant team to go over all the DCC projects and start to contemplate like, the sharing perspective of uh, existing population versus new developments. Expect to come back to council. I, I believe the next meeting in May for the committee to, to provide an update at that time. Thanks. Any other uh, business rising from the minutes? Seeing none, I'm going to move right on and we will go directly to departmental updates 10A 2023 RCMP community policy reports, first through fourth quarter of 2023. Staff Sergeant Dodds, do you have a presentation for that? I do. No. Thank you. I see uh, Ms. Delisell has it up on the screen for us. Thanks very much for having me today. Uh, I've, uh, I just wanted to quickly introduce um, <clears throat> Staff Sergeant Sean Baig. He's from the Southern District uh, Headquarters Office. He's my boss. So uh, oh, we should talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk to the side here after. <laughs> He's a good him. man. He's a good man. <laughs> and then uh, I have Adam Philippi. He's uh, one of our corporal supervisors here. Uh, at the detachment, so he came along to observe. Good. So, uh, plus uh, I needed the moral support. So. <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyways, uh, 2023, uh, just uh, I'll go I'll quickly go through the stats. I don't want to dwell too long <clears throat> on on the on the stats. They're all um, as you. Uh, I think everyone would have probably got this PowerPoint uh, ahead of time as well, but. Yeah. Uh, Pretty much um, overall, we're we're down actually quite in, in quite a few areas, which is really good to see. A couple couple areas where uh, we were up in, but <clears throat> for the most part, the numbers are so finite that it's uh, it's really not uh, too too crazy of a spike in, in any in any which way. Um, our overall calls for service. Uh, um, overall calls for service uh, for persons. Crimes uh, within the municipality, uh, 694. We're just slightly up from 596, or up about 16 percent. Our overall average for three years is 691. So, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty consistent. Mental Health Act, we were down a little bit, uh, 7 percent. Missing persons, SAR calls, we were down 57 percent within this municipality. We're pretty much average for the rest of the uh, for the provincial side. Uh, robbery, we went from four to two. Um, and then just keeping in mind, I, I think I say this every year, but these are calls for service that we accept through the door. These, This doesn't mean that these all of these calls are founded. Right. Um, these are just what was reported when it was made, the report was made to us. So it doesn't mean that people were charged, uh, you know, convicted, or there was um, in all of these instances. And it doesn't mean that they were all they all had substance. They were just reports through the door. 
Um, the stats, I'd be here for a month if you wanted to see those, all the other stats, but um, <laughs> sex assaults, 12, uh, 12 down from 15, 20% down from 20%. Corners Act, 23, uh, up um, pretty significantly, 91% from 12 in 20 2022. Um, keep in mind that, that corner, the Corners Act stat also includes us doing um, uh, NOK corner, uh, uh, next of kin notifications for other detachments. So it doesn't mean we've had a big spike in deaths, but um, uh, it's, it's just off again, all of those stats put together. Um, harassment down uh, 37%. Assaults pretty much the same, 88 versus 89. Ass uh, assistance, uh, abandoned 911s, et cetera. Check well-beings, 445. We have seen an uptick in check well-beings in the last little while, um, a lot of, of them to do with mental health. So um, uh, it seems to be a trend um, and it's something that we're, you know, we're looking at. And, um, but it's something that's pretty tough to control from our side of the thing. If people call, want someone checked on, that's, uh, we, uh, we fulfill that uh, request. <clears throat> Quarantine Act, I threw it in here just, it's probably the last year we'll have it in there, but. Uh, Zero, of course, because we're past the uh, the quarantine act measures from COVID. <clears throat> uh, moving on to property uh, calls for service within the municipality, uh, pretty consistent. Nine seventy three uh, for twenty twenty three, twenty twenty two was eight sixty seven, up twelve percent. Break and enters twenty one versus eighteen the year before. Um, our average over three years is twenty, so pretty consistent. Theft. A motor vehicle, um, 31 versus 28, and um, theft and mis mischief, 246. We have seen a spike, what I uh, wanted to point out, we have seen a bit of a spike this year in shoplifting. So uh, I think, uh, especially uh, at the grocery stores and stuff, so uh, not this year, last year, um, and don't know, we can only speculate, but it might be a uh, you know, just uh, you know, the economic uh, situation for a lot of people. Um, the other thing is, is that <clears throat> grocery stores have done some targeted enforcement within their, by their um, loss prevention officers. So we'll see little spikes when the loss prevention officer comes in, we'll get, we'll get two or three or five or 10 files when the loss prevention officer visits. So uh, yeah, moving on, calls for service, other municipal, so uh, other criminal code 238, versus 225 and 22. Uh, Liquor Act, uh, 40 in 2023 versus 2022. We have seen a down, you know, a bit of a downturn in the Liquor Act stuff. Um, uh, just with the changing in different uh, different laws and also the, the level of enforcement that's being um, done uh, with, when it comes to Liquor Act uh, violations. Um, drugs, Certainly, we've seen a downturn in that with the uh, decriminalization of the drug uh, of drugs uh, in British Columbia. Um, other acts, 250 versus 261, so pretty consistent. And bylaw tickets, we issued three in 2023. 2022, we issued 10. I don't know what happened there, but but I know uh, I know the bylaw uh, group has uh, has grown uh, under Ken's watch there, and uh, they're they're out the boat a little bit more often so they can handle some more files than, than what we do. It's not our main uh, job, but we'll certainly um, assist the city when we uh, when needed. Uh, traffic, call for service and traffic in, within the municipality. So 122 collisions last year versus 104 the year before. Uh, seven injury collisions uh, last year versus nine in 22. No fatals, thankfully, and uh, impaired driving calls for service. We have 107 <laughs> versus 96. Collisions, uh, just, I, I put the provincial one in here just to, by contrast to show. Uh, had 178 collisions in 2023 on the provincial highways, uh, 185 in 2022. Uh, 21 injury crashes versus 36 in 22. Unfortunately, we had five fatalities in the in the, in the provincial area versus uh, versus one in 2022. So um, uh, certainly up a little bit there, uh, which is uh, not good to see. Um, impaired driving, um, 22 versus 27. That's in the provincial area. 
A uh, quick snapshot of a, our administrative workload uh, within the detachment. Um, and I always like to throw this in because I think it's important for, uh, for everyone to know. Uh, total calls for service in 2023, 38, uh, 3,847 calls for service. That's up from 3,791 in 2022. Uh, municipal calls for service, 2624, which is uh, up about 200 uh, from 2022. Prisoners lodged 78 versus 88. And, um, but our front desk staff took 3,672 calls and uh, uh, about down 3% from the year prior. Um, our our front counter visits went went up probably because uh, you know uh, our office is more accessible uh, after COVID twenty eight seventy nine versus two four four three uh, information checks we do uh, for criminal record checks three ninety one versus three seventeen doing lots of transcription two hundred sixty three hours were spent transcribing statements etc that we took that's our uh, municipal clerks doing that. <laughs> uh, liquor licenses issued we saw that go up as well twenty four. Uh, versus 19 and calls for service uh, total calls for service was 37 SAR calls versus 29 the year before uh, I just I threw some extra staff in here just to show uh, to, to kind of demonstrate what we're doing in, within the city so 2023 municipal traffic enforcement stats within the city of Revelstoke uh, boundary 347 or 357 warnings uh, issued by general duty staff 190 violation tickets so 547 total traffic contacts. So that's uh, within the city. Um, BCHP, so BC Highway Patrol, also does some work in the city through their URSU unit. Um, and that's part of their mandate to work on trouble spots within, within the city. So they did 83 warnings, 537. Uh, oh, I made a mistake there. 537 traffic tickets. And they had a total of 620 total traffic contacts. So that's uh, almost par with what the GE guys did, uh, members did. And then um, our total contacts within the city, so 1,167 contacts. So we're out there uh, pulling people over, especially in school zones, uh, stop signs, you know, um, uh, doing cell phone checks, uh, uh, cell phone violation tickets, uh, uh, what happened? Other other big things, uh, other other hot button things, seat belts, etc. So, uh, impaired driving enforcement. I want to throw that in too. So, uh, amongst my group, and this is just my group only, not the BC Highway Patrol, we did 51 uh, 90 day immediate roadside prohibitions uh, with a 30 day impound. That's 51 throughout the year for the city. That's pretty good. 22 three day IRP. So that's three day suspensions. Uh, eight 24 hour prohibitions and um, three criminal code impaired driving charges. So that's straight criminal code, not through the provincial uh, motor vehicle act. And then uh, we conducted 25 impaired driving, uh, impaired, impaired driving check stops last year. So uh, that's uh, throughout the year, not just Christmas, not just uh, on special events, but um, whenever we feel like we should probably throw up a little roadblock. Um, and this last stat is just another, uh, uh, one that I threw in for this year. So, like I said, 3,847 3, total files generated in 2023. Those Of those files, that's 2,624 2, municipal. We have 1,223 provincial files. 32% of total calls uh, for service area were in the provincial area, or for service were in the provincial area. So 32% of, of our detachment calls were in the provincial area. 16 total regular members, 14 municipal and two provincial, municipally funded and two provincially funded. And that, that's about, um, so 12.5% of the regular members are provincially funded So in this detachment. So you can see a bit of a disparity there. 32% of the calls are provincial and 125 are funded by this province. So um, interesting stat. And uh, a bit of food, food for thought there. Does that um, mean we need to give that stat to Inspector McDonald when I'm asking? <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I, I'm apparently staff service says yes. So uh, um, yeah, it's just interesting. We spend a lot of time on the highway, yeah. and um, and um, you know we want to, uh, this this detachment. For those of you who don't know, is a is a split detachment. Um, it's it's uh, mainly funded by by the city of Revelstoke under contract, the policing contract. 
but we are are also responsible for, for the provincial area, and that's why we have two provincial police uh, funded members. But um, as you can see, 33% of our calls are out on the, 32% of our calls are out on the highway. Yeah. So generally, those are all highway related calls, most. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And then just to cap it off for 2024, um, our annual performance planning uh, is, is uh, it's been the same the last few years. And I think, um, uh, you know, barring any, uh, any, any uh, input or, you know, uh, uh, any other input from any of the stakeholders within the community, we're going to stick with these for this year. I haven't completed this yet, but this is the proposed annual performance planning uh, uh, goals uh, for this year is we're going to stick with impaired driving prevention and enforcement. We're going to keep on the traffic uh, safety side, uh, speed enforcement, certainly within and outside the municipality. Uh, municipal enforcement for other stuff, like I mentioned, cell phones, seat belts, uh, stuff like that within the city. Theft from auto, we're going to keep picking away at that uh, with our awareness programs, uh, working with the hotels and other, other places, especially in the Highway 1, Victoria Road corridor. Uh, that's where we seem to get the most theft, uh, theft from auto happening um, in that area. Um, and then we're going to keep uh, working at the prevention, prevention of assaults so within the community. So that's, that's our goals for this year. And I do track that, uh, track it through different ways and means, mostly stats, but other, other uh, prevention type um, uh, initiatives that we take uh, within, uh, with our stakeholders and within the city. All right. So one more slide there. No, and I, I just wanted to say, uh, <laughs> of course. I just wanted to say, I don't know if, I don't know if Paul sees that, but, uh, <laughs> and uh, Stephen, oh. but uh, no, I, what I actually, I threw this in here, not because I wanted to gloat that we won the hockey game this year, <laughs> um, but, uh, but I wanted to say actually a big thanks to Stephen and his crew at the fire hall. They, they did most of the organization and planning of that charity event. And, um, I think at last count, it was over $8,000 was uh, raised, uh, something like that. So I, I just wanted to be, uh, do a big shout out. I know we're kind of the, um, we're invited to come and play this hockey game by the firefighters. And we're kind of the, uh, uh, I don't know, the, 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 um, you know, the, the pe people that they're supposed to hammer on to make the money, but we won this year. So anyways, uh, but I, I do want to say that uh, I, I appreciate their efforts and it, it all goes to a great cause. And we had such a great turnout this year. And um, so, uh, yeah, thanks very much, Steve, and your crew. And it's it's fun for the community. We, we love to see this sort of thing. And, uh, I always want to kind of sit back and see who's the first into the who's gal there that uh, coming off the ice. And I think uh, this year it was fire department, but uh, yeah. you know, I take photos whenever I see a cop in the, in the, uh, in the jail, in the little uh, penalty boxes, we better take some photos because yeah. this is going to come in handy down. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks. Uh, Council, any questions for Staff Sergeant Box? Council Chair. Thanks for Bishop. Uh, to the Chair. Was it two goals you got? Did I get it? Yeah, I did get two. <laughs> Free career against the ball now. That's, that's not hard. We'll make sure he doesn't forget it. Uh, I did have a, a question, Your Worship. In all seriousness, uh, with 32% of our calls being uh, in the provincial area, that should be 5.12 officers being funded by the province just for a share. What if we get an update on what was promised at, at UBCM? We've seen nothing yet, and so I'll have to follow up with uh, Inspector uh, uh, regarding that. Um, yes, we were, you know, promised three positions uh, for highway patrol, which in all likelihood should alleviate. Uh, or GD officers having to go out there on a regular basis. However, when it's in our area, as Inspector Dodds or Staff Sergeant Dodds has, has said to me, um, they they go out and they do their thing. They're on the highway. They look after it. It's during their shift. They take take it. And unless it's a criminal code offense, Highway Patrol doesn't come in and uh, relieve you. Is that correct? Yes, Your Worship. So, uh, Highway Patrol, their mandate is set out by, as set out by the province uh, and uh, E Division, is um, that they, 
they'll they will respond to criminal code uh, fatalities. Right. Um, uh, but they and they and they don't take any calls for service. So anything that comes through our phone system, nine one one, etc., for calls for service on the highway, is not um, not dispatched to highway patrol. It's it dispatched to the general duty uh, members that are on um, on shift. And uh, it that's just that that is the provincial mandate. So um, extra officers on the highway patrol side uh, <clears throat> wouldn't do anything to alleviate the calls for service uh, kind of imbalance, I guess you could tell call. And so we'll have to revisit that conversation that we had with the inspector about that. So need a that motion? We, <laughs> no, we don't need a motion, but we need to, uh, we need to do that. We're welcome to make a motion, but we need to have that conversation. Okay. Appreciate it, thank you. All right, any other comments or questions, Councilor Orlando? I have just a couple of questions. Um, first one, just a small detail one regarding the 32% statistic. Um, uh, it's uh, through the chair. It says that total files generated are 3847. Um, is that um, incoming calls or are those generated by active enforcement? So my thought might be that the uh, highway patrol is out having tickets and that generates a file um, and that might be higher volume than municipal incoming calls. So is that is that calls? That we received, or is that include active enforcement files? Yeah, yeah, through your worship, Councillor. Uh, no, uh, the so those those calls there, thirty eight forty seven, uh, I think whatever. They uh, those are all general duty calls that have been. Um, uh, well, the, um, they are either generated by us or calls for service that are come through the uh, either by phone or from the front desk. Mm -hmm. Uh, anything that's self-generated by BC Highway Patrol is actually not in that number. That they have their own file count. Okay. For this okay. area. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's it's all uh, that's all general to be. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you worship. Yeah, and a separate question uh, to the uh, to the uh, the mayor, just in terms of uh, interface with the municipality and the follow-through interfaces that the municipality has, such as with provincial government, et cetera. Uh, what is uh, working well for you? What is What, what do you value uh, in that relationship, in that interface? And what uh, sort of things uh, would you like to see added, improved, bolstered to uh, make improvements for the, for the future? Uh, the chair to Council. Councillor Orlando, I, I just maybe want to clarify um, interface. How uh, um, you mean? Such as uh, you know uh, uh, negotiation for the province over funding, or how we manage the building uh, and facilities, those kinds of things, or community outreach programs that we help with, or hockey games, those kinds of right. things. So yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, um, what I can see is that say is that my um, I believe that the relationship certainly. From the detachment uh, at my level, with the administrative staff of the, of the city is is great. Um, I I do attend meetings regularly with the administrative staff. I speak to the mayor um, uh, regularly. Uh, you know, um, not reg as regularly as the administrative staff, but uh, we we chat. Um, our you know with the building, uh, of course, the building is a city owned building and that we occupy under the contract, and uh, it's it's highly maintained it's in excellent condition mm -hmm. um i have nothing but you know uh, you know uh, great things to say about the, our relationship currently it's excellent uh very supportive um we uh on the higher level things with the province i i really can't comment because i i don't have much input into that at my level um it's really uh it's uh, it's that's that's a higher way 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 above my pay grade on the on the police and contract side, and um, yeah, I, I, uh, the if I would suggest or my advice is is if there if um, uh, you know requests such as you know extra members etc. They all have to go through the province uh, through the e division, uh, and probably through southeast district and then up to. To e division, so um, there's a process there which um, which I can help somewhat facilitate, but I, I really don't have a lot to say. Great, thank yeah. you. Yeah, Mr. Parliament and Councilor Stevens. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I did further to that, uh, allow me to 
publicly say that the relationship that we at staff have with the ERC has never been better. Um, Chris attends our weekly management team meetings, and in particular, in the last six months, we were able to address some of the issues you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Specifically, we had an occupancy load issue with the arena, which Chris assisted in, mm -hmm. and that allowed us to have conversations with uh, LCRB. Uh, we also had, last year, the 125th anniversary, the musical ride, and all the logistics working with all the different partners. Mm -hmm. Having Chris at the table every Wednesday assists our staff in pushing some of these uh, projects forward that involve the RCMP, rather than us having to make a call or write a letter. So there's a huge advantage of having Chris attend though. So I want to publicly acknowledge the fact that he does spend the time. He meets with us Wednesday for two hours. He's engaged with all the senior staff and advances a lot of projects that affect Revelstoke. So hope that answers that question. Thank you. Councilor Stapenhurst. Yeah, th thank you. For the chair to uh, um, Staff Sergeant Dodds, uh, I have a question just in regards to the community as a whole, and I, I want to get your perspective on this. What's what's the greatest threat to the community as you see it based on these numbers? You know, what's what's the trend? What's your concerns? What's the, you know, where, where's the greatest opportunity moving forward and how can we address that? Well, uh, your worship, Councilor, Councilor Stephenhurst. Uh, so, um, number one, I, I, like uh, every town will have crime. Every town will have, uh, you know, uh, a set of people that are committing crime. Um, there's always the underbelly in any, er, any community I've ever worked in. Having said that, Revelstoke is, uh, you know, um, by, you know, either the, the most or if not one of the most um, kind of uh, lower crime places that I've worked since in, in my time mm -hmm. with the RCMP. So um, currently, we don't have any major spikes in, in any specific areas in, of crime. Um, we, we have to keep our finger on making, uh, you know, being out there, being visible, making patrols uh, to kind of keep that, um, you know, thefts, um, um, uh, different things happening at, you know, often at night in, in certain hot, hotter spot areas, closer to the highway, that kind of stuff. Um, I can't really put my finger on anything that's, you know, of course, uh, the drug trade is always going to be of concern for any police force in any town um, and that's something that we're always kind of picking away at um, and working at. Um, uh, mental health is also an area that we have seen uh, in, an increase in um, in calls for service. I have been working um, with Interior Health on uh, on certain uh, you know better ways of doing business when we do bring uh, people who have been apprehended under the Mental Health Act to the, to the emergency room here. Um, and I'm also on a, on a working group, um, an actual district level working group with Interior Health on uh, mental health, um, uh, how to make mental health, policing and mental health uh, more effective and uh, reduce our calls for service and also increase our, our, uh, our decrease our time that we spend, uh, you know, responding to those kind of calls. So um, I will say that there's one thing that we'll be rolling out here um, soon is that we're partnering with um, uh, we partnered with the Interior Health on um, on um, a thing called Health I Am, and it's going to be a uh, electronic, um, um, basically electronic uh, utility that we use as police officers to uh, ex uh, assist us with mental health calls and also to expedite our uh, our delivery of, of 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 clients to the hospital and and get them care quick quicker. So um, that's those are a couple things we've been working on. Um, uh, around here anyway it's been and, and they're taught in mind great so yeah well that answered your question thank you appreciate that yeah any other comments from council council Juan. right thank you uh, sure. mayor uh, yeah thanks for the report I, I love statistics and uh you know it's interesting that how how they get interpreted and mm -hmm. of course some of the numbers are really low so they're from a statistical percentage like the 100 percent increase is kind of a meaningless uh kind of thing I, I note um, one of them that may be of substance is the call for service for property because those are all up that little bit and they're bigger numbers. So, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm sort of curious, uh, uh, 
again, I think it's really good. You don't have the three year average red, red wave. When I see those, I want to see the five year and the 10 year average, you know, is there this sort of, and then, so it's sort of a curiosity. I'm not asking for any comment on that, but it's just, that's the only one that really said, well, maybe there's this trend of um, uh, <laughs> property issues. Uh, then the other one that I'm curious is on, so the drug liquor stuff. So there's numbers there that may have meaning, may not. Uh, so more anecdotally, uh, impairment, li liquor, re uh, alcohol-related issues, more from an anecdotal perspective. Is society, our society in Revelstoke, staying, you know, from your interaction with people and perceptions, staying the same? Is it getting worse? Is it getting better with the, uh, the attitudes and, and problems that are associated or assumed to be associated with liquor use or misuse? Uh, uh, through the chair of the Council of Palmer. Um, so with, with liquor, we have, we have seen a significant, like in my time with the RCMP, we've seen a significant change in the last five years with liquor. Um, it's interesting, like we've seen it, uh, less the you know the, the bars clubs pubs seem to be uh, well bars and clubs not so much pubs but we've seen a, a bit of a downturn in that kind of club type you know uh, um, uh, attendance you know um, and I th it may be as a result of COVID um, and when places were shut down a lot of them didn't reopen and then people got into doing the other stuff from home um, so we have seen kind of that decrease in, in that kind of alcohol usage at clubs and then, you know, fights and stuff like that. I mean, we still have the odd stuff going on here, um, and it depends on the season. But um, uh, alcohol seems to have taken a bit of a backseat to the talk about uh, the drug decriminalization and um, uh, the, that those topics. So... We, to be honest, we don't we don't see a lot of alcohol related stuff uh, as much as we used to. Um, it seems it calls for service as much as we used to. It, it seems um, we are seeing more, you know, uh, pr probably a little bit more drug use in different areas, but it's more out, I think, out, um, in the open than it used to be. Um, yeah, and I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm just speaking again. From my perspective, it's not uh, not really much for stats based there, but um, we're not. And and the 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 liquor act offenses that we used to write pretty regularly on the street for open liquor and you know someone walking to a club with an open beer and stuff. It's more of a um, we're 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 really working more at a at a um, you know a warning level that this you know hey you got to dump that out you can't have that on the way to way to the bar. <laughs> It's it's a tough ticket to write nowadays with the drug cheap criminalization um, legislation. It's it's really tough. You know, you could have someone smoking a joint here, which uh, if it's not in violation of any of the cannabis laws, and but and some they can't be charged with anything. But someone with an open beer here could be charged with a with a uh, liquor act offense. So, yeah, it's more information that we're providing at this point. Yeah. Interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, that uh, your stats are sort of reflective of what you're observing as well. So the other one, again, you have to kind of dance around the provincial funding stuff. Uh, again, looking at statistics uh, with a, a shallow analysis, we can say that, well, 32% of the total calls in the service area, provincial area, so the province cough up the money. Um, so... A question that you may not be able to answer um, is hypothetically, if the highway patrol had a more open mandate where they, so what I, where I'm leading to is, I wonder how much time is sort of the dead time. And if they were allowed to assist, maybe these stats would change as to if they were actually able to help assist. From, do, do you have a comment on that? Whether, and maybe you can't, I, I, I respect that if you can't, 
But if, if they had a more open mandate to help municipal, so that was more integrated in, in operations. Yeah. Uh, through your worship to Council Palmer. Yeah, I, I totally understand where you're coming from. I, I um, yeah, I mean, I don't have any much input in the mandate. Um, the mandate is uh, set out by the province and E-Division um, uh, for what Highway Patrol does. Um, it used to be that they did take uh, the calls on the provincial numbered roadways uh, versus if if they were available. Um, the, the problem is that our part of the issue is, is that the makeup of those units are they they you know, they, well, number one, they don't have enough bodies to be 24 seven, and most of those units don't operate 24 seven. So at the end of the day, the call would fall to the general duty uh, detachment of, of jurisdiction. Um, so there'd have to be a lot of changes for, for them to assume more of a role in those day-to-day -day calls. Um, and that's like, again, way above my pay grade. Um, but yes, it, back, you know, years ago, they, uh, the traffic, uh, the traffic services, as they used to be known, now it's Highway Patrol. They they would they would assist us. So I'm not saying that these uh, members don't assist us either. They do assist us. Uh, they just don't take the substantive file. And um, they they. But if they're working and they're around, they will assist us. These these Highway Patrol members are excellent. They're they're very helpful. But they do have to kind of stay within their guidelines as well as set out by the province. Great. Thanks. Good. All right. Any other comments or questions from council? Staff Sergeant Dodds, thank you for your report. And I uh, really appreciate the fact that uh, you and your colleagues are proactive in our community and uh, with what you do. So thanks again. Appreciate that. Staff Sergeant Beggs, thanks for uh, driving up and being here. And uh, for, uh, for watching in, so you get to do presentation next time. <laughs> All right, thank you, appreciate it. All right, Council, we are going to move on to item 12A, uh, PRC 2024 first quarter report. And uh, we have Ms. Donato here. Ms. Donato is not here this day. Okay. So any uh, questions or is there anyone in here instead that's going to do this uh, report? We can put that on Mr. Parliament and see yeah, how it sure. goes. <laughs> um, so Mr. Mayor and Council, I, I can say just quickly going over this summary that I have participated in several of these events and uh, the most significant one was the Winter Carnival for sure, where we had over 2,000 people show up down on Centennial Park. I thought that the vibe was amazing. The vendors were out full force. Um, the weather contributed, and, and the races were just simply outstanding. The outhouse races and the community spirit. Um, it was well organized. Um, the, uh, the snow sculpture, which you see a picture of um, our staff and some elected officials standing in front of. Um, the music, of course. Um, the uh, events at the uh, rink, um, I did attend, as, as did Councillor Cherry, the, the U13 Provincials. Um, sometimes we forget that it is more than just figure skating and uh, minor hockey and old timers and, in of course, the Revelstoke Grizzlies. But the U13 brings a lot of tourists into town. Um, the, the arena was busy in the last year with hosting the Cyclone Taylor Cup. And of course, the exciting playoff run we just concluded by, by winning the championship. Um, so I am very, very pleased to see these numbers continue to grow. And a shout out to the rec department for organizing these. Uh, my final comment was last night, we basically had 24 hours. We were hoping for a game five on Friday. And in 24 hours, word got out, uh, both public works and recreation put on a rally at five o'clock last night on downtown to recognize our Grizzlies and introduce the team to the community. Um, it was well attended. And uh, I think that event is indicative of just the work of the rec department staff. So shout out to them. Thank you. Great, Mr. Parliament. Any questions uh, regarding the report to Council Yeah, um, yeah so um, my thanks to the uh, director running a, a tight ship, but a good ship, uh, the recreation and uh, uh, 
the I'm appreciative of the uh, on the social media how they're promoting the ch you know, changes in swim times and that kind of thing and programs. And I I've noted uh, seems to be a, a higher level of interaction with the library as well and that partnership. That, mm -hmm. uh, so very appreciative of that. One the probably one of the biggest uh, comments that I get and have had over the year the recent years is. Um, Compared to five years ago, pre-COVID, our service levels, as far as the aquatic center, are actually down. Uh, of course, we had COVID. There's that history, and then sort of the, the twilight time of COVID, and, and then post-COVID, a reduction largely because of staffing. Staff levels are uh, certainly, I, th I think, genuinely and. Um, and there's been some operational changes. So the actual service level, the ability for people to swim is, is down. And so it's just a question that's going up there. And uh, you know, what I hear from the public uh, is a, a longing for those days for when there was more, more hours. So I'm just mentioning it just to, so we have that kind of highlighted because that's a service level that uh, we seem to have lost. We did, and, uh, and so that's one of the comments. And I know there's a staffing issue. So it's just a comment. I'm not actually asking for any answers or reply at this time. I appreciate that. I think we're all cognizant of the fact we're having the time to uh, get new uh, life cards, that sort of thing, to embolden that, uh, those hours, uh, that sort of thing. And again, it comes down to uh, it's a provincial problem where seems like every rec department's having a hard time trying to get uh, certified lifeguards. And we do more training as well. But then once we get them, unless they're already members of the community, we that major problem of housing. You know, that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. Kind of a circular effect with that. Uh, and I'll, I'll note that uh, you know, the recreation department is going out of their way to provide that training so, yeah. proactively to uh, yeah, intent of recruitment. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. appreciate the comments. Any other comments, Councillor Lana? Uh, yeah, Your Worship, um, uh, and uh, I'm aware that the director's not uh, here today. So, um, just to follow on Councillor Palmer's comment, uh, one of the uh, feedback I often hear about rep service, and it's often family focused, kids focused. Um, is, uh, you know, they have, they, they have demand or they would like to en enroll in something, but they, there's no room available for it. So, um, you know, um, so, uh, in the future, you know, one of my thoughts is as we go forward, um, council having and, and, uh, having better sort of situ situational awareness of those things, those programs that become fully subscribed in under five minutes, you know, because there's such an intense demand uh, for for those things, you know, summer camps and child uh, related uh, things. Uh, so that uh, as we, um, uh, as uh, administration and council engage in um, decision-making about allocating resources, we can be aware of, you know, where we can definitely, um, you know, take advantage of, of uh, having that data to inform our decisions about where the demand is coming for uh, recreation services. So just sort of similar thought on what you mentioned. Okay. Uh, thank you, Marshall. Um, yeah, with the report, it would be great um, to see kind of what the usage for the multi-purpose rooms and the other rooms in the rec center are. Um, just when we're in the winter season, uh, indoor activities um, are needing space. So it'd be great to see kind of what the usage looks like uh, year over year, just so we can make that as accessible to the community as we can. Great. All right. Appreciate that. Any other comments? Seeing so none, we'll carry on. Thank you. Um, moving on to 7A zoning bylaw update, draft zones, draft zoning map. Uh, and uh, Mr. Simon in a Reader's Digest format for the one version. Do you worship? Uh, happy to give a presentation if council likes, but the presentation was included, so leave it up to you guys, sir. Well, we'll look at the presentation. Oh, we'll skip it. <laughs> Mr. Black has told me no more than uh, seven minutes. Is the timer going, I believe? <laughs> I'll give a nice high level overview and make sure that there's ample room for discussion. 
So thank you, Council, and thank you, Council and Community, for their patience as we've been plugging away at this zoning bylaw, which has been a lot of fun. So today we're going to talk about the first major milestone of this final update as part of our comprehensive zoning bylaw rewrite. So I'll go over a little bit of background. The presentation overview looks scarier than it actually is. We will keep it high level as we run through. But a little bit of background on how we got to where we are, general summary of the changes, alignment with our official community plan, housing action plan. Looking at, you know, we do need to talk about some future official community plan amendments that will be needed in order to implement this new zoning bylaw. Uh, looking at some of the changes for permitted uses, going over some major zoning changes of note that council and community should be aware of, and next steps. So, general background, I won't delve into this too much. I think council has a pretty firm idea on what zoning bylaws do. In a nutshell, it regulates use and density on properties. What you're allowed to build, how much of it you're allowed to build, and then importantly as well, whether or not you're allowed to subdivide your property, chop it up into multiple pieces, raise separate title, sell them individually. We did an update back in January 2022 under prior council. What we called this was to capture some low hanging fruit. So we introduced accessory dwelling unit abilities, garden suites, carriage suites, introduced some flexible regulations for greenhouses. We left them in the front yard rather than restricting them to the backyard, let them be a little bit bigger, take advantage of sunlight exposure looked at reducing some parking requirements for areas that are walkable. But with that update, it really was just that, the low hanging fruit. We still have a lot of work to do as part of this final stage of the zoning bylaw comprehensive rewrite. <laughs> That's why we broke it into two stages. So where are we at right now? So staff at first major, major milestone uh, at the end of March, I believe March 22nd is when we did the formal release. And with that, it was a drafting of all new zones and applying all those zones to a new zoning map. So it might not sound like very much, but that is about 80%, 75 to 80% of the work for this bylaw. It was substantial. There was a lot to go through. There was a lot of hands that had been in that old zoning bylaw over the decades. You know, in the end, it really, even though we did this update in 2022, it really was just a rehash version of our 1984 bylaw, which was a rehash version of the 70s bylaw, which was a rehash version of the 60s bylaw, so on. So we've never really done a zoning bylaw update of this scope. So quite substantial. So what are the key changes that we accomplished as part of this rewrite? So looking at all the uses that we had in the zoning bylaw, a lot of overlap, a lot of duplication, created a lot of confusion for people. So even when we added new uses into the bylaw, we were still able to take the total number of permitted uses that we have to regulate different forms of development in the city from 192 all the way down to 99. So about 48% reduction, pretty substantial. We did an analysis of all of the existing zones in the bylaw. We had some zones where they were only applied to one property, some zones that weren't applied to any properties. We crafted new zones. Some of them are similar with some updates. Some of them are brand new zones. We reduced the overall number of zones, again, while still creating some new zones that are really cool from our perspective. Took the overall number of zones from 60 to 40. Pretty substantial decrease of 33% there. We applied all the new zones to each property in the city, and we were as careful as we could to try and not create the technical term as lawful non-conforming buildings and uses, whereas the other more commonly referred to term is grandfathered. So when we're changing zoning of properties, we wanna make sure that we're not messing up what's already being undertaken on the subject property. So really careful with that. We did things like review business licenses, looked at aerial photographs, reviewed old permits that were issued on the properties to make sure we weren't tinkering too much with what is existing and approved on site. So what are the changes ultimately accomplished at this stage of the project? Well, it enables a greater diversity of housing supply throughout the city. This is taking us direction from the official community plan. We know we need to build more on the lots that we have within the city and we can't always be looking at expanding our boundaries to accommodate growth. It's not financially sustainable. It's not environmentally sustainable. The OCP is very clear about this. We need to provide more housing with what we have, and we need to provide a greater diversity of housing, more apartments, more ground-oriented development forms like row houses, duplexes, garden suites, carriage suites, the whole, the whole shebang. We align with the official community plan and the housing action plan. So we'll get into that in a little bit further of the presentation, as well as Bill 44, which is the minimum requirement of three to four units per property that the province introduced in November of 2023. 
We introduced more residential mixed use zones into the bylaw. And again, we remove those outdated antiquated zones that don't really have a place in modern development. One of the things that we did that took direction from the OCP is apply a new environmental conservation zone to various properties throughout the city. And what the intent was there was to align with the land use map in the OCP, so our future desired land use. We have a lot of properties that were identified as sensitive and they had an environmental land use designation. So now they have the zoning to go along with it. And then again, we updated all the permitted uses for better consistency between zones, reductions of land use conflict, and greater control for council and the community over those contentious uses. So we talk about alignment with our official community plan and housing action plan. There's 19 actions between those two documents that relate specifically to amendments to the zoning bylaw. 10 of those 19 actions are complete as at this critical stage of the project. The other nine actions are continuing to be worked on as we work on the last section of the bylaw that we're hoping to release by the end of May. Attachment one in your package shows the status of each one of those actions. We looked at alignment with the OCP, obviously, and when we did that, there were some inconsistencies between not only current zoning and the land use designation that's assigned in the OCP, but as well as the proposed zoning. And this reflects the more parcel specific analysis that was undertaken for the zoning bylaw compared to the OCP. So with that, zoning bylaws must align with the OCP. We have 57 properties or groups of properties that need OCP amendments to align with this broad change to the zoning map that we have. And to better understand why some of those changes are needed, you gotta understand how the OCP defines different terms in there. So low, medium, high density is really important to understand because when we look at high density land use in the OCP, we're talking six story buildings. So if we give a high density zoning to a property, you know, maybe you have a property that has the old R4 zoning that's high density, caps maximum height at, you know, three, four stories. If we all of a sudden give them a high density zoning, that's really changing the character of the area that the community hasn't bought into yet. So you'll see that some of the OCP amendments, a lot of them went from high density residential in the OCP to medium density residential to reflect not only existing uses on site, but to better align with some of the zones. And one of the results of that is our high density zones that we have within the proposed update to the zoning bylaw weren't actually applied to any property. So we call those floating zones. So they are available to be rezoned to. Someone who wants to rezone to it may require an OCP amendment triggering more public involvement, which from our perspective is warranted because if we are talking six plus story buildings, probably should have some significant public involvement in that decision and in that process. So we really did a solid cleanup of the OCP land use map as part of this as well. And just for transparency, again, attachment two includes all of the properties that require OCP amendments and then the specific rationale to justify it. We looked at all the permitted uses as indicated. So there's significant use reconciliation as we refer to it that has been completed, reduced the total number of uses by about 48%. All the uses in the bylaw will now be defined really hard to regulate uses in the bylaw if they're not defined. And we had many uses in the bylaw that did not have any definition. So, you know, care center minor was an example. What does that mean? We had it permitted in all of our residential zones. When someone comes in and says, I want to do this, what do I have to do to do it? What does it mean? It's really challenging for staff to interpret that consistently over time. So those definitions become quite critical and all the uses are now defined. Uh, we distinguish between contentious uses for greater control over location. So council may recall we had a public hearing not too long ago for changes at Mackenzie Village development for some commercial uses. Retail use was a major point of contention and discussion at the table. And, you know, there's a very big difference between a retail store and a grocery store. But we have it all lumped in under the same use retail store in the current zoning bylaw. It's really challenging for council and the community to regulate that effectively. So we've broken out that use as an example so that we can more effectively regulate it. Council wants to say a grocery store is permitted in this location, but general retail is not. They now have the control to do that. We removed regulations that were previously embedded in definitions. So an example of this is our home-based business definition. You know, it might have regulations that are embedded in there. How many business-related visits you can do per day, how many employees you're allowed to have. And when you have regulations that are embedded in a definition, you can't change them without amending the bylaw. So if someone wanted to come in and apply for a variance and say, council, you know, the home-based business definition says I can have one non-resident employee at my business. I want to have two. Well, if they wanted to change that, they would have to apply to actually amend the bylaw, which is a much more complex process to go through rather than applying for a development variance permit. 
So when you take the regulations out of definitions and you put them in standard conditions of use in the zoning bylaw, an individual can now apply for a one-off variance at council's discretion, making it a lot easier. The staff report does include examples of other uses that were changed and attachment three provides a full summary of that use reconciliation. So getting into the really interesting stuff, what are some major zoning changes of you know, at, uh, at this critical stage? So the complete rewrite of existing draft zones and then applying them to all properties in the city is quite a complex undertaking. It's no small task. Staff did prepare a fact sheet that includes a little quick cheat sheet in there. People don't want to go through the whole map. They don't want to go through all the zones. They can go through that quick cheat sheet and it will say, oh, you're R1, you went to this. Now there's a caveat in there because some properties are not like for like. Not all R1 properties went to the RLD1 zone, for example. So everyone, you know, maybe 99% of them did, but there are the one-offs. So everyone really needs to double check the zoning map to see what they're currently zoned and what we are proposing to zone them to. And we did do an online map as well so that it was really easy for people to punch in their address, click on the property and it says, oh, your current zone's this, click on this link if you wanna go check out and see what that means. Your proposed zone is this, again, click on a link, it will take you to the new draft zone document. So on the map here, you'll see a portion of properties, 15 of them to be exact on Victoria Road between Kootenay Street and Pearson. Uh, these are properties that staff recommend pre-zoning. Again, council doesn't have to support this, but this is what's currently included in the draft zoning map. So these 15 properties are proposed to be pre-zoned to the MU3 zone, which is scenic corridor mixed use. They're currently R2. They were the only stretch properties on Victoria Road that were not zoned for mixed use, either being the downtown core zoned properties or the scenic corridor zoning properties. So this just brings them into greater alignment. So as we see new development coming in along that scenic corridor, we get that continuous development form. Again, one of the prior changes that we mentioned was the new environmental conservation zone, the E1 zone. So the city had a whole whack of properties that were zoned rural residential 60 hectare district and urban reserve district. Those two zones, especially the RR60 zone, was carried forward from the CSRD zoning bylaw when the city annexed its properties back in the 80s. It allows for everything under the sun. Shouldn't say that, but it allows for a lot of uses, including our most intensive industrial use, which is manufacturing and processing heavy. So we allow for that in areas where they're quite environmentally sensitive. As you can see on the map here, just roughly circling the areas that were changed from either RR60 or urban reserve to E1, as staff are proposing. Yes, this does constitute in some ways a bit of a down zoning. However, these are critically sensitive areas within the city and we've never had a zone to reflect that and now we do. So staff are recommending that we apply the E1 zoning to them. So, you know, for instance, around the Jordan River, I know that a lot of it's crown land, but the province does account for the zoning that we have to a property. And we apply zoning that says heavy aggregate extraction is okay in this area. The province will consider that when there is an application made. If we say this is zoned environmental, our OCP has it designated as environmental, that sends a very different message to the province when we're sending our referral comments to them and council's making a decision. So you can see the E1 zone, it does, we got it broken up in the top half of the city and the bottom half, it almost sort of forms kind of a bit of a buffer around the city, again, protecting those sensitive environmental areas. And within the E1 zone, the only use you're allowed to undertake is environmental conservation. And we have that defined basically any works to promote conservation of the lands. You're allowed to have a, a dirt trail on there for public use, that's it. I'm gonna let you put a paved trail on there. So again, really looking at how we preserve these lands for future um, future use by Revelstoke residents, as well as you know preserve biodiversity. So when we get into the residential zones, huge consolidation of all of our existing low density residential zones. We had four R1, R1A, R2, R2A, and as well as all the, the spot zones for vacation rentals, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But all of our standard low density zones, they were proposed to be wrapped up into a new low density zone called RLD1, Ground Oriented Dwelling Zone. We slightly reduced setback, so instead of your front yard being six meters, it's like five meters, instead of your rear yard being seven and a half meters, it's five meters. Uh, it introduces a maximum lot size of 550 square meters, so we're not seeing huge lot subdivisions and a minimum lot size of 400 square meters. Between those four zones, the minimum lot size previously was between 400 and 550 square meters. So not a huge change, but again, if we're going to see more low density development in the city, 
we want it to be on smaller lots to promote affordability. This is one of the ways that the zoning bylaw works to promote affordability on the market housing side. It allows three to four units per lot, so long as it is no more than two separate buildings. So we are aligning with the provincial legislation, but what we wanted to avoid here is the creation of little mini cottage courts where people build four single family homes on one lot. So we say, okay, you know what? You can have four dwelling units, no more than two buildings. Be creative, flexible of how you want to accomplish that on your lot, but don't put it in more than two buildings. Many of the rural residential zones also went to this RLD1 zone. So one thing to really be aware of there, because we want to get rid of the rural residential zones. They're carryovers from the CSRD when the city annexed these properties back in the 80s and even before that. You are opening up subdivision potential on these lots now. So CP Hill, for example, a lot of those properties were zoned rural residential. Now they would be zoned this RLD1 zone. You can subdivide on them now. That said, they still need to prove out servicing, access, any environmental sensitivities or hazardous areas need to be accounted for. So there are still a lot of checks and balances. It, won't, it can't just be a free for all. We have a new density, a new low density row house zone. So RLD3. So it's very similar to the R6 zone that council just approved. Uh, the only difference between the R6 zone and the RLD3 zone is the LD3 zone doesn't uh, allow only for secondary suites. It would allow for garden and carriage suites as well. And then it has some additional provisions for how access would need to be accommodated in those scenarios. The R3 zone, which is the medium density residential zone is removed and replaced with three new medium density zones. Uh, the height was increased to 15 meter maximum. So about four stories, we'd be regulating density on a floor area ratio basis at 2.3. Most of the R3 properties either received, you know, as they were existing, either the RMD1 zone, which is a row house zone for medium density, or a RMD3 zone, which is a condo zone. Now the one in the middle, the RMD2 zone, and similar to the high density zones, we introduced two zones that are residential rental tenure only zones. One of the cool things we get to do within a zoning bylaw in BC, is you can have zoning that only allows for rental buildings in there. We don't have that in our bylaw right now. You have a proponent that comes in and they got a big development and maybe a portion of it. Council says we want it to be rental housing in perpetuity. This zoning would now allow council to have that tool to require that with a new development. So really interesting. And then in the R4, which is our current high density zone, vast majority of R4 properties right now that are developed went to a medium density zone because again, our new high density zones are much higher density than what our current high density zone is. Uh, the new high density zone lets you go up to a 21 meter maximum height. So about six stories, floor area ratio 3.7. And one thing to make note of for the apartment slash condo zoning in medium and high density, staff do propose that we allow for a little bit of mixed use in there. They're not standard mixed use zones, but within these zones, we have recommended the uses personal service establishments. So things like dental clinics, medical clinics, office space and cafes. But we do we did put a clause within those zone that said it can't be more than 5% of the total floor area of the building. So maybe have a little bit on the ground floor. And that's again, trying to promote this idea of walkable communities, some mixed use development in a thoughtful way that doesn't detract from our downtown and doesn't permit uses that would be seen as contentious. I don't think anyone would have a major concern, at least not that we've come across, to allow a little bit of office space within an apartment building, for example. So some other changes of note. So outside the conservation area and outside the downtown area, the red highlighted area, that I'm not sure if council can see that very well, we have 18 properties and they are documented in attachment four with the full list. We're recommending pre-zoning these to what we call the RLD2 zone. Very similar to our LD1 zone, but it's small lot ground oriented dwelling zone. We have a lot of these old 25 foot lots within the community that are, un they, they aren't built upon right now. We found 18 of them that could accommodate some infill development, some narrow single family homes. Council may recall, you have seen a couple of variances to reduce minimum building width, reduce setbacks and increase lot coverage to allow people to build on these 25 foot lots. This would allow these 18 properties, the automatic development right, to just go ahead with a building permit, cutting down on the process, cutting down on the applications that we're receiving, and just giving them that development right. We do know we didn't apply it to the Heritage Conservation Area. We didn't apply it to any of the properties in downtown that already have the commercial zoning. We also created a new low-density tourist accommodation zone called RLD6. The intent here, again, and I want to be really clear with everyone, 
We're not proposing any changes to development rights for any properties that are permitted to undertake a short-term rental. The only change we're proposing for those properties is that we increase the minimum lot size so that they can't subdivide. And that's to reduce proliferation of properties that are zoned for short-term rental that could then potentially subdivide and have more properties that are zoned for short-term rental. Makes it harder for us to control in that way. So we took all the previous spot zone properties, those quote unquote B properties, as well as the 59 properties adjacent to Hay Road that were allowed to have short-term rental with a permanent resident on-site operator. And we've lumped them all into this one zone. And as we revisit this topic with council in October, you know, council says, yes, staff, we want you to look into short-term rental regulations further, do the work this year and into 2025. It'll make it a lot easier to pursue amendments because we have all the properties wrapped up into one nice neat zone. We looked at all the comprehensive development zones, which originally we had considered whether or not we do that as part of this project or do it as its own separate project. We did it as part of this project. So again, that was quite an undertaking to go through. Uh, as a result of the 22 CD zones we have right now, we're recommending that 10 of them be removed and be lumped into our standard new zones that we've established. They haven't had any development rights taken away. And if anything, their development rights have been expanded. And again, we've added conditions of use within each zone to allow easier access for the public for cross-referencing. Good example of that right now, if someone wants to build a garden suite on their property, they go look in their R1 zone, oh, garden suites of permitted use. Oh, I set back seven and a half meters, six meters, I'm not gonna be able to build this. Come in and talk to us and we're like, oh, hey, you gotta go look in a different section of the bylaw. This section up here tells you your setbacks are only 1.5 meters. They say, how am I supposed to know that? Good point. Let's put it right in the zone and say accessory dwelling unit regulations are detailed in section blah, blah, blah. Makes it a lot easier for people to cross-reference within the bylaw. So it's a lot to digest. You can certainly understand that. And there's a reason why we are presenting this to council about six months in advance of formal consideration. We want council to have the time to digest this. There's a lot of attachments in the report. It'll take you guys some time to get through it. And it's going to take the public some time to get through it. So what are the next steps for this project? We're doing engagement right now, doing what we're calling coffee chats on the draft zones and the draft zoning map. So we've had <clears throat> three so far this week, two more tomorrow, and then five on Friday. We are looking at about 20 slots for each session. They're filled up. We're gonna have to hold more. It's looking really, really good. We're probably gonna have between two and, two and 300 people that are participating through this process by the end of it. Um, they've been going really, really well, and the public is very happy to come out and give feedback. And we've already received feedback that's going to result in changes. So a really, really positive way to engage with the community on a more intimate level, rather than saying, come to an open house and look at some boards and fill out a survey. It's a more thoughtful conversation with the community. So once we've completed that, we're going to be working on the remaining sections of the zoning bylaw, the parking regulations, the loading regulations, all the basic provisions like accessory dwelling unit regulations, home-based business regulations, all that good stuff. We're hoping to have all that done by the end of May. And what we're recommending to council is once we have that done by the end of May, let's do a public release. Let's let the community know. June, July, August, summer is obviously a terrible time to be doing substantial community engagement or holding public hearings for something this big that represents a substantial change for the community. So we recommend taking the summer. The public can come in. They can have individual meetings. We'll document that as part of our overall engagement for the project but the public can come and chat with staff to get more information on it. We'll host more formal public engagement in the fall and then present it to council fall slash winter of this year. We don't think it's a good idea to be holding public hearings over the summer for something of this nature anyway. And then once we have that again, moving into the fall, more public engagement, and then this will require a formal public hearing for council. Uh, we'd be looking at probably October, November for that to be held right now, depending on the feedback we get from the community and from council. So for council to fully review and, and understand the scope of the changes, we have prepared the following. We got an information sheet with a summary of the changes, cheat sheet, really encourage council to take a read through that. It will help decipher some of this a little bit. We are talking you know, quite a technical bylaw and the scope of the changes that are made today, someone five years from now might come in and say, I didn't know that this change was there. And it might be something as granular as the way a definition is written. We got to appreciate that and we got to understand that is the case, but these are living documents. We got to be better about updating these very frequently. We can't let it go for 40 years without updating it. Very, very critically important. So rest assured, you know, council is going to have to make a decision on this at some point, but it won't be the last decision you make on a zoning bylaw. 
we have lots of lots of time to keep evaluating, monitoring, and adjusting. Top Rebel Stove, we got the online web map, to map tool that I referenced, and then the supporting attachments to this report. Really, really important. Staff put a lot of time in going through to make sure that we are as transparent as possible. I wish we could break it down into an easier to digest way, but it's really important. And you know, when we have a zoning map here, for instance, that doesn't fully comply with the OCP land use map, we have to document that in a really diligent way for public record. So I know it's a little bit to get through, and that's why we're having these coffee chats with the community to try and break it down as simple as we can. But we are talking a technical complex bylaw. It's different than the OCP. The OCP will say, let's support diversified housing forms. That's a great motherhood policy statement. But then when you get into the nitty gritty of the zoning bylaw, you're really talking about what does that look like in practice? What does it look like in development regulation sense? So it's a lot to unpack and we can definitely appreciate that. So with that, that's more than enough of me talking and I will pass it over to council and we are happy to answer any questions that you have today. I think I was over 10 minutes, so I'm trying to judge. Well, uh, so I know you, uh, you got it done well. Councilor, so any questions or comments as to what you've seen so far and the uh, procedure as we move forward? Councilor Cherry. Thanks for watching. Councilor Palmer pushing you to go first. Yeah, we're just discussing <laughs> uh, that. A couple questions to the chair. Um, I feel that we've fallen short with pre zoning. Why has only a small number of properties been pre zoned, especially with there being so many empty lots, such as the former C10? Councillor Cherry. So, when staff, we originally, so we really got to work on this about April last year. And council may recall, we did go over the project management plan with you and talked about some key parameters to give some initial direction to staff back in February 2023. And one of the items we talked about was pre-zoning. And what we heard from council is that pre-zoning at this time wasn't entirely preferred or sought after and that council still wanted people to have to go through a rezoning process so that there was more notification, more public engagement. And something to keep in mind when you pre-zone a property, not only do we lose out on the ability to negotiate amenities, but now we've had changes to legislation, which you know may negate those negotiations, the ACC legislation. Um, but it also, when someone's going through a rezoning process compared to automatic development rights where they only need a DP, there's no notice of application signed. We don't do any advertisement in the newspaper for notice of first reading and the public really might not be aware of what's happening. So if council wants to give direction through this process for pre-zoning properties, staff will make the changes most certainly, but we were taking the direction from the original conversation in February of last year. Follow up, council. Uh, I have a couple other questions, but I do appreciate that. I do remember the conversation. I think I was one of the people that wasn't in favor of pre-zoning uh, for many of those reasons. Uh, another question, uh, a conversation that happened when we were first elected was a temporary use permit in industrial lands for workforce housing. And at that time, Councillor uh, Palmer brought up a very good point that this may be something that should be considered when we redo our zoning bylaw. Has that been considered in this? Through your worship, Councillor Cherry, yes. We have looked at ways to embed more employee housing dwelling unit rights within a variety of zones within the bylaw. So there are some zones, you know, for instance, the MU4 zone, the live work zone, does allow you could have two employee dwelling units if it's not part of a mixed use building in there. So you could have two detached employee dwelling units on your property and then you could have a commercial building on there. If it's part of a mixed use building, you can have as many as you want. And we also put parameters in. One thing that we've seen frequently that is a little bit of a trend because we are in such a tight housing crunch right now, hotels are being used for staff comps sometimes. So we've put parameters in there that clarify through the definitions of you know short-term rental, long-term rental hotels that you are allowed to use tourist accommodation for employee dwelling units. Now, one thing we will have to reconcile with that is parking is reduced when it's for employee dwelling units. And what happens when they're flip-flopping back and forth? So when we get to the parking regulations, we gotta be creative with how we can accommodate that because we wanna be able to allow for it, but we also don't want someone coming in and saying, I'm building a hotel and 50% of the units are for employee dwellings. And now our parking is reduced significantly. And then the next day they're like, actually just kidding, it was only 10%. So something we definitely need to be considered of moving forward. Okay, and then just quickly uh, to the chair, duplexes with suites, are you also allowed to have an ADU? Through your worship. So the way we've drafted, and I, I just to clarify, are you referring to our, our base low density zone, yes. the, the residential low density one zone? The way we've drafted it is you can have a total of four dwelling units. We don't care what kind they are. 
they can be in no more than two dwellings or two buildings rather. So if you have a duplex and you put suites in them, that constitutes your four dwelling units in one building. So then again, sorry, your worship, to the chair. Uh, if there was a party wall subdivision and then in that scenario, a duplex with suites would be allowed? Oh, sorry, and an ADU on top of that? Because that would be three on one. Through your worship council, Cherry, if they did do a party wall subdivision the way that it's written right now, and this is one of the items that we, we do need to unpack a little bit more, they would be allowed under the new legislation to have three units per lot because they're technically subdivided lots. If they stratified it, then they wouldn't be allowed to. This is one of what we think the potential unintended consequences of the legislation is. So the way we originally had this written, we referred with our external consultant is the only way that party wall subdivision would be permitted is if you were in the RLD2 zone, mm. the small lot zone, which would mean you'd have to rezone. And after staff reviewed internally, we didn't think that was right. And you know, if someone can meet all the parking requirements, all the usable open space requirements, after they've already built a lot with a duplex and they've subdivided it into two and they want to throw another third unit on there, if they can meet all that, which it's going to be really challenging for them too, good on them. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Just looking for clarification because I keep getting asked that same question and I don't have the answer. Uh, love to hear from the rest of the council. Thank you. Uh, through the chair to Director Simon. Uh, question, you just mentioned the parking requirements, and I kind of see that as being one of the biggest bottlenecks now to this development. Right? Like if you look at you know an R3 lot, and the current per, current parking requirements are two per unit, well, the only way that that could possibly be applied to the new current zoning bylaw regulations, if I'm understanding this correctly, is to do almost underground parking, which is you know roughly at a cost of $100,000 a stall, which now makes development unattainable for most. So when are we gonna be looking at the parking? And then the other the other thing that I see is like a bottleneck is, and we don't have to have this conversation now, but when we look at our sewage waste treatment facility and, and the, the hiccups that we're having with that. But right now, if you could address the parking, that'd be great. Your Worship Councilor Stapenhurst, parking is something that we're hoping to have fully drafted along with the rest of the bylaw by the end of May. So all the basic provisions, parking regulations, supplementary regulations, things of that nature. It's going to be, parking is always a major point of contention. Mm -hmm. Right now, what staff are thinking is that we're probably going to land on one and a half parking stalls required for multi-unit uh, multi dwellings. We have to think really carefully if that's going to be reduced further if you're in an area that is you know, proximity to transit, grocery, pharmacy, things of that nature for basic amenities. We live in Revelstoke. Cars are really important. You know, it's I love from a planning perspective reading what Edmonton's doing in places down south in the states that are just axing parking requirements. The province was pushing for that hard as well. We got to be really thoughtful with this. We already know we have challenges with street parking for snow removal, mm -hmm. and we don't want to exasperate that. But we also got to find that right balance because two things for council to be aware of the best way that we can support more affordable housing on the market side you reduce the carrying cost of the lands for the owners which means getting them through the process faster and parking when you have exaggerated parking requirements for these developments it most certainly impacts the ability for them to sell those units at a more affordable price so something to be aware of it is going to be a point of contention and I will say right now, we don't know exactly what the final requirements are going to be proposed to be, but they will be less than what they are right now. Thanks. Uh, thanks uh, through the mayor. Uh, um, amazing work. It, it's a lot of stuff. It really is. Uh, and it's been uh, you know, a, a, a long, long journey going back and thinking about with the previous council with that um, low hanging fruit thing that you talked about. Uh, you know, now in hindsight, you were ahead of the curve of the province and, um, you know, we didn't foresee how, how far the province was going, but that I think helped you to uh, get to this point. So we're doing all this massive work, uh, quite, quite astounding, actually. Um, the, uh, a couple questions. Yeah, good, good information. Yeah, and uh, I'm going to have to digest a, a lot of the more, a lot of stuff I really like and, I, I'll try and limit my comments. I just quickly, just notice on the heritage. So you had the area for the 25 uh, foot lots. 
It, it looked to me that some of that was in the heritage area. Now it may not be, uh, but I just, it's, I'm going, because you didn't have the heritage area outlined, nor went to expect to that, uh, but it, it seemed, and I, I, and I guess if there is 25 foot lots in the heritage area, although it might be challenging to do that, but why, you know, why not? Um, and uh, so that I, I don't necessarily need a answer, but it's just some, some thoughts on that. And I just, yeah. Through Mr. Mr. Palmer, if just one piece of context, um, we would, staff would certainly be happy to take direction if council wanted us to do an analysis to see what 25 foot lots in the heritage area could be accommodated with that RLD2 zoning. Mm -hmm. One thing to keep in mind, the heritage area gets really tricky because when you're building on those 25 foot lots, every house you see will be a flat roof to retain the snow. In the heritage area, our heritage conservation area design guidelines say you got to build the pitched roof. Mm -hmm. And when you walk through the heritage area, I do almost every day walking home, mm -hmm. they're tight lots. And when you start to put another lot that's going to be an A-frame roof, mm -hmm. it might be quite tricky. But it's an interesting idea. But if we, what our fear was, if we pre-zone some of those properties, then every heritage alteration permit we receive would be non-compliant. Yeah. If be able to yeah. Issue it. Okay. Yeah. I see the challenge there. Yeah. I'll have to let that one marinate. Yeah. So, so the idea of having snow storage in between two buildings is not, not cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, interesting. Um, really liked, really, really liked the upzoning of environmental zones. So thank you very much for that work. Um, and from my lens, that is absolutely upzoning for the community. It's making our community uh, better uh, work on that. Um, Parking, yeah. So the whole this whole thing with parking, which we'll be hearing, we'll continue to hear uh, is this tension between providing parking, providing a, but allowing affordable um, a development or more affordable and creating those opportunities. So that tension is always going to be there uh, and articulated. So just I guess it's more through with staff listening, but also through to council and up staff. Um, uh, one of the elements that I've learned uh, from the Gold by Bike people, who have the, the cycling community, is the importance of affordability in our community of alternate transportation. So this is the implication. This is not a zoning thing, but this is the implication of things like parking. So if we make it easier with, uh, for people to use alternate transportation that's not just bicycle that's electric vehicles whether you know, that's that that's evolving as we see the new kinds of vehicles um and so that reduces the need but we need to have that infrastructure which of course costs money uh, but we need to get out of this 1970s 1980s kind of concept of car communities designed around cars and be, be open to um modern concepts and new concepts, evolving concepts and designing around people instead of around cars. So just a, a comment on that. Um, and yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that, but I'm, I'm really excited about the work you're doing. So thank you very much. I well, appreciate that. Thanks. Any other comments from council? Council Lucio. Uh, thank you, Marcellus. Um, yeah, I've got a couple questions, so I'll start out um, with the greenhouses that were addressed in the rewrite. That's all continuing with this comprehensive rewrite. Your Worship Council Lucio, yes, that is correct. Cool. Um, when it comes to uh, food security and livestock, um, the only thing in there is um, hen keeping, chicken keeping. Um, is there anything else considered? Um, would beekeeping be a definition that could be included? Through your worship, Councillor Lucio, that's a really great question. And actually, one of the individuals who came to one of our coffee chats made a suggestion as well. So when we took all the rural residential properties, some of which permitted the use of agriculture, which would include the variety of activities that you're describing, when we took that out, they all got the low density zoning, and now agriculture isn't permitted. So we're going to be considering what is the minimum lot size that would be required to accommodate agriculture. Urban agriculture with livestock starts getting really, really tricky in some areas of the city. You really need to have enough land. And just to give you a general idea, if you go to a regional district or a county in Alberta, you're usually looking at one animal unit, which is one cow for every four acres of land. So like, you really need a good bit of land to sufficiently accommodate livestock. 
but this was brought up internally as well, the keeping of bees. Um, we're thinking that we'll include some cool regulations for that, that will stipulate how many hives you'd be able to have on your property. Cause it's not as invasive as a lot of people think it is. Yeah. And it's uh, it's quite a great form of agriculture actually. Okay. Thank Certainly you. more work on that. Um, in return, in regards to the RLD zones, um, is there a definition for long-term rental and how long that would be? Through your worship counselor, Lucy, out. Yes, there is. Uh, it would just be anything greater than 30 days. So distinguishing from our short term. And one of the items that we're going to have to discuss as we delve into all these additional supplementary regulations that we've been trying to grapple with, we got some feedback early on in the process of how are we regulating long-term rentals where some of them are housing 10, 20, 30, 40 individuals, right? Maybe exaggerating on the far end there here, but we've heard, we've all heard stories Banff, you know, they had a situation where they had 46 individuals living in one dwelling. And when we chatted with our building, our chief building uh, official, Mr. Gibbs here, as well as the fire chief, you know, it's something that we got to think about. And it's not intended to be a way to kick people out of their houses, but we have to think about what is the maximum cap that we should have for long-term rentals for occupant safety. And the zoning bylaw is one way that we can regulate that either through the definition of long-term rental, we could say it stays greater than 30 days, where no more than two individuals up to a maximum of 16, maximum of 12, whatever that number should be, um, would be permitted, or we can put it through conditions of use within a zone. We don't wanna be overly restrictive, but it's something we're gonna to have to think about with this update the community has brought it up as well. Okay, thank you. Um, in regards to short-term rentals with all our residential zones, it's not a acceptable use. Um, would that be something that we would have to address I don't know we have our conversation later in October, um, but that would be through bylaw changes more so than the zoning rewrite. Through your worship, Council Lucio. So what staff are hoping for in October is that we have another conversation with council and council says, yes, we want you to pursue amendments to the short-term rental regulations. Then we would initiate that project. We didn't want to do it as part of the zoning bylaw rewrite because it'll really confuse the public. And it will also, it'll turn this bylaw that already has massive changes in it into all of those short-term rentals and then it will detract from the other items and we don't want stuff slipping through under the radar we want people to be aware of it so it'll be its own separate project but it would require zoning amendments in the future if council does want changes and that will be a separate conversation in the future but for now we didn't change any development rights other than increasing maximum lot sizes for properties that are permitted short-term rental just so in the in the interim we don't see them subdivided which is a concern but we have lumped them all together into one zone so it'll be easier to deal with in the future. So everyone that has a V property right now, you're getting a new zoning called RLD6. And they're all nice and organized into one zone now rather than scattered through 10 different zones in the bylaw. Okay. Um, in regards to RLD4 zoning, um, we passed um, the bylaw for um, subdivision of trailer parks. Um, when it comes to that subdivision, would they get the RLD5? Rezoning through worship council Lucio, exactly correct. Um, I mean, an owner could choose to try and rezone to something different, but if they wanted to stratify the mobile home park, they wouldn't have to go to LD5. And the LD4 zoning, just for clarity as well, because we have brought this up in our coffee chats, we're not proposing any changes to manufactured home park zoning. No manufactured home parks in the city are getting pre zoned to something different as part of this process. They're all retaining their what's comparable to their existing zone. Um, what we did do though for the manufactured home park zoning is we had all these old regulations that we had to refer to in a manufactured home park bylaw that's from 76, I believe. So things like your setbacks, and it was super confusing for people. So we've taken those out of this old manufactured home park bylaw and put it into the zoning bylaw. So that's the only way we change the zone, but it makes it easier for people to know what their setbacks are. Okay. Um, and reading through that zone, um, there's an 8,000 square meter minimum for subdivision of an RLD4 zone. Um, with the trailer parks that have been zoned that, are all of them eligible to be subdivided or does that size requirement um, stop some of them from getting subdivided? Through your worship, Councilor Lucio, that 8,000 square meters is taken from the manufactured home park bylaw that I was referencing. So we took all that stuff out and put it right into the zone so that you don't have to cross reference. Um, we'd have to check to see, go over all the individual manufactured home parks to see what their parcel size are, to see which one would be eligible for subdivision. I can tell you off the top of my head, some of them. Um, may be eligible for subdivision, but the vast majority of larger manufactured home parks we have, except for the Oscar Street one, 
they're already subdivided into two, three, four parcels right now. But the 8,000 square meters, it's not like it would allow them to subdivide individual lots. That's quite a large, it's almost uh, almost a hectare, right? But should yeah. council want to increase that? Council could set it at 60,000 uh, square meters if they wanted for 60 hectares to say, just absolutely no subdivision within those zones. We don't anticipate people subdividing within those zones. If they wanted to, it would be smaller lots and they'd have to rezone to the, the LD5 zone. But that's certainly a change we can make with this too, just to be safe. Council wanters too, that's no problem at all. Okay, um, one last question would be employee housing. Um, through the RLD4 zone, um, it's just in as one employee housing. Um, was that same from the same bylaw that you're referring to? Through your worship, that was, I believe that that's actually existing in the R5 zone within the current bylaw. Um, but again, if council would like to see some of those numbers increase, and this is why we really want you guys to take a look into this, delve into it, and then come back forward at a future date, maybe with some resolutions, directing staff changes, and you know, council all getting on board with it, we can add more employee dwelling units. And one of the ways that I think is really important for council to view this bylaw, if we can ultimately make it through the approval and adoption process, it is going to serve as such a great baseline for us. It's not going to be the end product. We're going to continually be refining and improving it, but it will make it a lot easier if council says, we want to increase employee dwelling units within the city. Well, we have employee dwelling units to find. We have it consistently referred to in the bylaw. We have the like, consistent conditions of use. It's not scattered and complex, and we wouldn't even know where to start. So it really does give us a solid baseline to make those changes should council wish, uh, wish to see them done. Okay, thank you. Uh, sort of one last question. Um, short-term rentals in regards to the multi-use and fring, downtown fringe, um, were those, was short-term rental already allowed in those zonings or is that something new that's been added? Uh, through Worship Councilor Lucio, just to clarify, downtown fringe zone, the MU2 zone, correct? Yes. Uh, yeah, so in March, April 2022, when we updated the short-term rental regulations, short-term rental was added as a list of use in there, but that's one of the zones where it has to be run by a permanent resident on-site operator. So you'd have to be living in your suite, renting out above, and be the operator of the short-term rental, or vice versa, living above and then renting out your suite. And you'll notice one of the things that we did as part of this update too, um, for those short-term rental regulations specific to that zone, it's embedded right within the zone. So it makes it a little bit easier for us to manage moving forward too. Okay, awesome, thank you. Good, thanks for the questions, Councilor Chair. Uh, just further in the, further on that last uh, point, Your Worship, uh, to the Chair, for the C2, what's currently C2, that's only in residential homes, not in mixed use buildings. Your Worship, Councilor Chair. In C2 right now, the use tourist accommodation is also permitted. So short-term rental, Excuse me, they would only be permitted within a single family dwelling in the C2 zone. If they wanted to do something broader and more commercial nature, then they would be looking at the tourist accommodation use. Okay, and then just for clarification in what that new zone would come into, if it's a mixed use building, that still would not be allowed. Uh, through your worship, Councillor Cherry, I will just double check, but I believe we still, yeah, we still have the clause in there that says multi unit dwellings, mixed use buildings, tourist accommodation, and short term rentals not permitted in there. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Any other comments from Council? Councilor Lennon. Uh, your Worship, yeah, just a couple of questions uh, through the chair. Um, uh, first one is regarding uh, a comment uh, from Mr. Simon, and thank you for the presentation today, the great presentation today. Uh, when you commented that, that Council could, you know, make suggestions or changes, we also have an ongoing consultation process. I'm just a bit unclear as to at what stage in that process those Council directed tweaks or changes would come. So that, that's the first question. Uh, through Worship Councilor Orlando, I, if, if it is okay, and maybe Mr. Parliament can, I don't know if he has anything to add on, but if Council would like this to come back for another Committee of the Whole meeting at a later date, maybe over the summer or in the early fall where you guys have had times to delve into this and you want to propose some some resolutions for making some direct changes. Staff are totally okay with that. Mm -hmm. If council wants to wait for us to finish up all the public engagement, present the changes, because we'll be documenting the changes between now and then, of course. And if council wants to wait for the public hearing, you know, maybe when we get to public hearing stage, you just give it first reading, hold the public hearing, hear what the public has to say, take a few weeks to really marinate on it, and then come back and propose changes at that time. We're okay with that too. One of the, there's so many changes in here and council has really great authority. You are the ultimate land use authority. 
this is our time to make some some good changes and to really be thoughtful about it. And that's why we want to do this through a longer process. So I would actually be looking for a direction from council. If council wants us to bring it back before a public hearing, we're happy to do that. If council wants to wait till after they hear everything from the public and then recommend changes all in one go, that also is uh, is an avenue that we can pursue. Further comment? Uh, your worship, yeah, just to follow up on that and then uh, for the question through the chair, um, you know, my preference would be to sort of hear what the public has to say, uh, then, uh, you know, uh, have that opportunity if council, for example, feels it's important that, you know, we decide on a, a critical issue that, you know, needs to be, we feel needs to be something that is, is uh, directed by council, so maybe that's after the summer, after the, the uh, comment period. So, I mean, we don't need to make a decision on that today. I guess the second uh, question I had through the chair is um, in terms of tangible things you're hearing from residents uh, so far in the consultation period, I'm wondering uh, what they are, some examples. And the reason I'm asking the question is to uh, uh, sort of provide insight for people who may be listening or uh, asking us questions on the kinds of things that the kinds of opportunities they have right now. Um, so I, I know you mentioned uh, beekeeping was something that came up as a comment for someone uh, in response to Councilor Lucio's question. So what are some things you're hearing and how can residents now, because really this is your window of opportunity right now on a really substantial things that a piece of um, a bylaw that will change a lot of things here. What are some things that uh, you're hearing now and what kinds of tangible things can they uh, take a much one of these sessions uh, weigh in on after having uh, taken a quick look first? Through Worship Councilor Orlando and maybe even just before delving into that, just to clarify kind of the scope of engagement because it is such, it is a really technical bylaw and the vast majority of people, like we're asking the questions in these coffee chats, how many people have navigated the bylaw in the last couple of years and maybe, you know, 15, 20% of the hands go up if that or maybe the little half hand, right? So we are kind of, when you look at the engagement spectrum, we're on that, that far end of the spectrum where it's informing and educating the community and consulting with them and we are certainly taking feedback to, to potentially make some changes but thus far the the engagement with the community there's a real desire for that education piece mm -hmm. so the questions that are being asked are it's not so much recommendations for changes at this point like there's a couple that are along that line but most of it is really just trying to wrap their head around what this ultimately means for them so we're having people that are coming to the coffee chat sessions and you know on the spot they're like oh my address is this what is my current zone? What am I going to? What does that mean for me? And then staff give them a brief overview and 10 other people in the room have the same question. So it's good. But the main thing that has come up so far is ironically something that is beyond our control, the three to four units per lot minimum that's imposed by the province. That has been by far the single most talked about topic. And so what we've been really trying to do with the community and what we've really encouraged the community to do because and just to give council a heads up, you're going to see a report coming forward. We're targeting the first week of May or the first council meeting in May to address Bill 44 and be done with it. But we're also doing this work with the zoning bylaw on the back end. So what you're going to see staff proposing, we've been telling the community this is a two-step process to address Bill 44. The first step is quick amendments to get it done to align with the legislation by June 30th. Mm -hmm. We recommend those amendments in the least invasive way possible, which is essentially duplex with suites to comply with the legislation. If this community wants to be more flexible with how we accommodate the baseline density of four units per lot, you know, maybe we do allow it in four buildings, maybe it's two buildings as proposed right now, but that's the feedback that we want from the community as part of this process. We want to be more thoughtful and we want to reflect the desire of the community for the development form and how we accommodate that density. Of course, the province has said, be as flexible as you can, that's what we want to see. And while as a planner, I can appreciate that, the community also has to have their say in what development form they want these four units to take. So for the community, that is the biggest thing that's come up. And we really want them to think of, do you care if it's four row houses compared to a duplex with suites? Do you care if it's a fourplex that's two below, two above? That's the feedback that we want to get on that particular topic. Um, some of the other items that have come up is properties that were currently zoned rural residential 60 hectare district that are going to the new E1 zone, the environmental zone. We've had some individuals that... Um, I wouldn't say that they're overly concerned about it, but they do view it as a down zoning. And there's been a couple of comments of, well, is the city going to provide compensation? Well, mm -hmm. council is well within its rights to down zone properties in BC. And it's also not something that doesn't mean 
it negates the process that you can apply for a land use change and go to council. What we wanted with that process is if someone wants to apply to rezone, then it's a more substantial process that involves public engagement and council involvement as well. I don't want someone opening up a heavy industrial use in an environmental area that for some reason was pre-zoned for it back in the 80s, right? So those have been the two main things that have come up so far. Well, excellent. Uh, just a quick follow-up. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, a great answer there. And it's great to have situational awareness of sort of uh, the numbers, uh, for example, when talking about uh, sort of this organic uh, response to the, the minimum three, four uh, uh, properties per lot um, prevent new provincial regulation. Uh, just uh, for clarity, uh, what are you hearing on that specific topic? Are they coming and saying, this is great, uh, where's my building permit? Or are they coming in and expressing concerns about that? And what are you hearing? Uh, through Worship Council Orlando, uh, a little bit of a mixed bag. And maybe Mr. Gibbs, I don't know if he has any of that on because he's been sitting in these meetings too. But from my perspective, there has been, you know, concerns that are raised by it. And, you know, everyone knows that we need housing. A lot of people are very supportive of infill development. But I don't think that there's an appreciation for this unilateral approach that has been imposed upon us as a local government, rather than being able to kind of control our own destiny, if I'm giving my honest assessment of what we've heard so far. Sure, thank you. I appreciate it. All right, any other comments from Council? Councilor Paul. Uh, thank you, Mayor Solicitor. A couple of follow-ups. Two things that I forgot to mention. Um, the so the, the 10 CDs, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that we're uh, fixing mistakes of the past that could have been done even without this. Um, the other, um, and this might be sound like I'm trying to put some pressure regarding DCCs, again, not directly related to the zoning. It might sound like I'm putting pressure on because I am. Um, uh, uh, is uh, with the zoning, there's a lot of development rights that are going to be established, and if we don't, or if we don't have the DCCs in place, uh, the current tax base is going to be paying for the benefit of developers, basically. Um, so that's important, along with the infrastructure. Um, so just to follow up from uh, Councillor Lando's comments regarding, okay, the timing. When does when does council come in and give the provide direction and not? And I concur with Councillor Orlando that get this that with the coffee chat. I'm thinking before the public hearing though that conversation. Mm -hmm. So that summary, okay, coffee chat summary, talk Revelstoke. You come back committee the whole. This is this is the sense we have time to sort of marinate and think about. Um, I quite frankly imagine what the future looks like when we're going down streets. What does what do these four units look like in our residential areas? You know, actually visualize those kind of things. And I would encourage the public to do that too. Um, uh, Cause that, that's the big change. And I, and I, I think if we'd, you know, spend the time and then get your summary well before the uh, public hearing. The other is uh, if we're waiting until, um, you know, the fall, then that's making it kind of tight for you. For, and so I think that's something that could happen in the summer when uh, uh, many people are not necessarily in the engagement, but it's uh, an opportunity for council to roll up their, our sleeves and, and perhaps provide some um, uh, direction at that time. Um, and then, then just the last thing, that I'm, I'm really impressed with the coffee chats, like if that's filled up. I, because the, you know, with the experience of local government and lack of engagement, you create all these opportunities to open houses and nobody shows up. That's, the, that's the history. And you've filled these things up and I'm just saying, wow, that's, that's great. Like, so good, good initiative, but I'll, I'll be very honest. Like when I got the letter, dollar, dollar letter at the taxpayer's expense, it's like, oh, is that, is that good money, investment money or not? But when you get a letter to you directly, you know, Tim Palmer, you know, owner of such and such property, you open it up and say, oh, okay. And so I think that's answered that question for me is that you've got this engagement. My neighbor uh, across the street said, oh, I just got this letter from the city. Should I be pay, paying attention? I say, yes, you should. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for that. And they got good quality coffee. <laughs> All right. Any other comments? Uh, one last time.
Councilor Cherry. So your worship, uh, I was hoping someone else would ask it. Uh, through the chair to Director Simon, uh, can you dive into a bit more detail about the number of residents that are going to be allowed in each home in our current zoning bylaw? You did mention what happened in Banff, and I want to make sure that something like that doesn't happen here. Uh, through your worship, Councilor Cherry, I can tell you exactly what the definition says for long-term rental right now. So section 11 of the draft document, it has all the uses in there. So it's not a complete list of all definitions that will be in the zoning bylaw, but it has all the uses and how they're proposed to be defined. Um, and this is, again, another really important piece, like council, like delve into this stuff. Like staff will welcome feedback from council passed via resolution that says this definition is an issue. We see we want to change, right? So really delve into this stuff. So the way that's defined right now is long-term rentals a dwelling unit, which any number of sleeping units are rented, whether the owner resides on the premises or not, to no more than two unrelated persons per room, up to a maximum of 12 persons in the dwelling unit. So it's that's an important piece. And again, the goal isn't for us to go and start kicking people out of their homes and actively enforcing that. But if we ever run into an issue where it does become a life safety issue with many people in there, and if it's okay, I would like to put him on the spot a little bit. With Mr. Gibbs here is our um, chief building official. There's not as many tools as you would think in other provincial regulations to regulate this from a life safety perspective. So we got to think carefully about it for the zoning bylaw to give us that tool. Yeah, absolutely. So well, excuse me, while we were drafting this bylaw, Director Sam and I have talked about this topic on a few occasions now. Um, when it comes to long-term rentals, we just want to be careful because yes, there are limited tools within say BC building code regulations around designing the building or to do, applying the current requirements of the building code for the number of uh, people within a unit or sorry, within a bedroom to a existing dwelling. So we end up mostly relying on the fire code uh, to impose those kind of regulations. But ultimately the way the building code is written essentially is designed as uh, two people per room. That's how a building is designed for bedrooms. It's two people per bedroom. That's not to say you can't safely fit more. It's just that's how it's determined. So once you start getting above that number per bedroom, you start looking at some challenges that come in and some additional regulations, things like fire alarm systems, uh, increased egress requirements, so your number of stairs, your number of flights to the exterior, things like that. So there does have to be a bit of a balancing act for us to ensure that the we're not over-regulating it to the point where obviously housing is a need. We don't want to be having a situation where people can't get into these units, but at the same point, doing it within reason where we're still allowing a safe occupant load within that building. So um, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know if the chief has any other additional to add on that, but a, a lot of it does come down to looking at BC building code requirements, BC fire code requirements, then applying a fair balance between the needs as well as, well as balancing that life safety. If I can follow your worship, uh, you mentioned provincial uh, legislation that affects this. Have you looked at any federal to make federal legislation to make sure it's not in controversy or sorry, contravention of any of that as well? There is a federal regulation for how many people per room. Uh, through your worship, Council Chair, are you referring to the CMHC guidelines? CMHC, I, I can't. Re we reviewed the CMHC guidelines issued by the federal government, and they have recommendations, and they make it really clear in there that they're not requirements to be imposed, but it's it's how they calculate when people are in housing need or core housing need. Um, and if there's anything else, staff would be happy to receive it and review it further to ensure alignment. And I will note too for Council, um, really important piece too. When we have the full bylaw drafted by the end of May, that's when we're going to kick it for legal review as well. So this, this hasn't been for full legal review yet. Staff are quite confident and we do engage with legal quite frequently on a variety of topics. Um, but again, instead of doing piece by piece legal review and spending too much money on it, get it all done in one go. And if there's major changes after that legal review, then obviously we confer with our counsel. But as of right now, um, it hasn't been up for that legal review, but that will happen before a formal bylaw is presented to counsel. Great. Follow? No, that's that's good, Your Worship. I'll have to take a look at uh, what that document was called, but uh, it'll get it'll get taken care of in the court. So I'm fine. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, gets into sort of a lot of, kind of academic uh, thinking. Uh, reminds me of uh, 
Mr. Trudeau Sr. saying that government has no business being in the bedrooms of people or something to that effect. Uh, the, uh, and, and really, that those a lot of those questions. So if, if there's six, you know, you have two unrelated. Well, if they're related, how many? Uh, the And if they're not related and there's four or six or eight, becomes a, you know, do you know? Uh, are you going to have cameras uh, going to City Hall? But uh, yeah, so it's an enforcement thing and whether you even know, yeah. So it gets pretty tricky uh, in how much effort we get to try to regulate things that are almost impossible. So it's, uh, yeah, it's an, um, interesting. A lot of interesting sort of ideas that come up here. Thanks. Yeah. And this, sometimes this comes up after, uh, you know, a tragic event in a, in a home. And, and I've been in situations uh, in emergency support services where uh, you walk in and you realize that uh, that fridge box is one person's and the next fridge box is the other person's. And it's cardboard. They're surrounded by that. And we just have a fire event or something like that. So looking at this and making sure that we're on uh, you know, even playing field is imperative. But you're right. How do we, how do we regulate? That as we move forward, and it's uh, just by making sure that we have enough housing in the building. So. All right. Uh, any other questions? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Simon and your team. I appreciate uh, all that you've done and to put this forward. Uh, you've given us some homework. So now the ball's in our court to, to read through all this stuff and digest it. And we really appreciate that you've been quick and uh, really comprehensive. and. Uh, no, and I, I'm glad the coffee chats are working out so well. It's uh, pretty, you know, pretty awesome. So, Councillor Luciano, you have one more thing? Uh, thanks, Marcel. Um, should there be a recommendation for when this would come back to us to discuss it in a little? That's up to you guys if you want to make that now, Councillor Palmer. Yeah, it's a, a good, yeah, I think it's a good point. Um, I think uh, just because of the approach to planning, Mr. Simon and his department, I, I think you're getting that read from us. So, uh, we could do that as business arising if we're not hearing any anything rather than unless you have a proposal right now. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Think, Simon, thoughts? And, and to your worship, sorry, I really don't want to interject, yeah. but one thing that I would recommend, we have it's already April 11th, so it does scare me a little bit because we are crafting this document in-house. Like we are really at like 98, 99% of this being done right. fully in-house, which is awesome to see. And you know, that shows the capacity that's being built up within the group. But I would just caution because we're, we're on a really tight timeline to try and hit this end of May. And if we don't hit the end of May, then timelines might get stretched out a little bit more. So if council says, you know, come back in June or come back in July, we'd want to have a good idea of the full bylaw being wrapped up in draft form by the end of May. So that's the only word of caution, I guess, that I would have for setting a date right now. Um, and staff would certainly be looking to get formal council direction at a committee of the whole meeting prior to formal bylaw consideration. Okay, so you're okay with us holding off on a date to see how you progress before we make that statement? Uh, certainly, if staff are okay with it, if council's okay with it. But if council does want to set a date, that's okay. Um, just be prepared that if there is a delay in getting the full bylaw complete, then that will be our focus rather than getting the staff reports and everything prepared for the next council. Yeah, so to the mayor, when, when would you, and maybe you don't know right now, but just leaving it uh, loose, uh, when would you anticipate coming back? Um, and, and maybe you can't answer that right now. Through your worship, Councillor Palmer, a large part of it will be dependent on the feedback that we get from the public. Because, and, and thus far, and we don't anticipate this will be the case, but if the public does come back and they say, this is awful. I can't believe that you guys are even considering this. If that is, in a nutshell, the feedback we get, then obviously we know we got some work to do going back to the drawing table. The drawing board. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to happen, but uh, hopefully by the end of May, we'll have a really solid idea because the bylaw will be in full draft form. We'll have our engagement strategy. I could call it a loose engagement strategy over the summer and then a more formal engagement strategy for the fall. All of that will be flushed out. So we'll probably be in a good position to come back to council at a committee the whole meeting for another update through the summer. And that might be the right time, you know, if council does say, we want to keep chewing on this and contemplating it, and then the individual council members can prepare amendments for formal council consideration at a committee the whole meeting in the fall, maybe. 
That's true. So, I have, a, I have a question just going back to the parking lot. Parking bylaw will be ready at that time, too. Uh, do you worship Council Stephenish? Yes, we're targeting end of May. So, the whole bylaw in its entirety in draft form. And that's why I'm saying it might make more sense. You know, once the bylaws in full draft form, we'll come back to Committee of the Whole sometime over the summer, we anticipate. And then maybe at that time, Council says, you know what, we've digested the whole bylaw staff and presented it. We're going to do a bit more engagement in the fall with the public. And maybe at the conclusion of that engagement, you guys will have a better idea of the dates. You can say, you know what, bring it back to the committee of the whole. We'll make some recommendations for changes if there are any, and then we'll move forward into the formal council consideration process. Does that seem to yeah. make sense? It's a good plan. You guys are okay with that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks again. So I'm going to uh, call for uh, moving in camera. Uh, I'd like someone to make a motion pursuant to section 90.1 D and K of the community charter to move in camera. Councillor Stapeners, Councillor Dublin, all in favor? Motion's carried. We'll take a 10 minute break and come back in camera. Thank you. Oh.